Chris, uh, Bama, 18, Georgia, 33. Kirby Smart finally gets the monkey off of his back. What were your initial impressions of the game that happened on Monday evening? Uh, I mean, yeah, I thought Georgia, when you look at the game as a whole, I really thought Georgia just dominated the whole game, which is exactly what everyone expected to happen for the SEC title game. And we didn't get that. And so everyone kind of didn't really know what to think. But we saw 12 games of, of, of resume from these two teams. And this game looked like the full season encompassing. Georgia was dominating the best team in wedding close, And Alabama struggled when they played a really good defense. Uh, this is this is true. This is true. There is a lot that happened in the game that likely changed the script. Uh, at the end of the day, Georgia was significantly the better football team, and they have been uh, for the majority of the season. Uh, sans that trip to Atlanta, which we can talk about the Atlanta curses and whatnot. But uh, but yeah, I mean we we got the Braves a title, we got the Dogs a title now. Uh, hey, how about this question? If if you could have done, like if you're a Braves and Georgia Bulldogs fan, would you rather separate them out or just go on and get them both at the same time? Like if you are guaranteed you're probably not going to get another one of these for 10 years, which obviously we don't know that. But if you couldn't get it for 10 years, would you rather have Atlanta win one like next season and Georgia win one this season, you know, that kind of stuff? I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> like that's a, like what does it matter? Like both of you you're a fan of two teams and they both won a title. Like would I rather, you know, the, the dogs not want it this year because I'm still living off the high of the Braves? And so, therefore, you know, can they win it two years from now when I feel, you know, worse about my Braves team? Like, I, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> it's, it's something I just literally thought up on the spot, but I was like, man, they got both of them. Both teams felt like they were cursed for a long, long time. Bulldogs fans, 40 years. Braves no, fans no, no, since no, 1991. No, no, no. No. You, you can talk about the Bulldogs all you want. The Braves were not cursed by any means. And the Braves have operated like a small market franchise for the last 20 years, which means you're only going to have one or two shots every 10 years to try and win one if you're going to operate like a small market franchise. The Royals, went all in, won a title. Not even close then. The Indians went all in, got close to winning the title. Not even close since. Like, this is how baseball works. Baseball is big boys are in it all the time, but don't always win. Small markets can win, but if you're not going to be in it every year, then, then you've only got one swing at that apple, and that's it. And that's, you can't operate the way the Braves have operated and expect to be in. That's not cursed. That's not snake bitten. Okay, well, then let's talk about that as it relates to Georgia. We're going to flip it around just a little bit. Can Kirby Smart continue to operate the way that he uh, built the team this season with a quarterback like Stetson Bennett and continue to, uh, yes, he will compete for championships. Can you expect to win championships going forward if you don't do something with the offense? Well, first off, why do we work in the under the assumption that he's not going to do something with the offense? Do we think that this offense is going to look exactly the same next year? Like, Kirby Smart is doing what Nick Saban has done, is doing what you're supposed to do, which is top five recruiting class, and, and really not top five, top two or three, every year after year after year after year. So, yes, he can do it again. Because he's going to have more talent than everybody else. Yeah, I don't think you're necessarily wrong there. The reason I bring it up is Stetson Bennett can come back and play next season. And how odd would it be to take the first national championship winning quarterback in 41 years at Georgia, who is still on the roster? And because remember, they tried to do this with Jake Fromm, or or didn't try to. They they kept him around maybe longer than they should have uh, because he was what was best for the team at that point. They thought. I I'm just curious which direction they're going to go with it next year, but that. We're not worried about that right now. Obviously, we're going to preview all that kind of stuff. Let's uh, let's talk about some of the things that happened in the game. The First off, this game was violent. Violent defensively. It was so much fun to watch. If you are uh, a defensive fan, 
I think like you and myself, yes, it can be brutal when they are not scoring touchdowns, etc. But the chess match that was going on between these two defenses, pre-snap, especially pre-snap, trying to figure out where the pressure was going to come from, who was doing what in the in the back seven. It was really, really interesting to see what they were doing. You know, what Georgia did was just try to limit the explosive play, and it worked. What it, What do you think the biggest... The biggest uh, play in this game was, it, I guess, the biggest thing was actually Jamison Williams going down. But from there on, what would you say was the biggest play in the ball game? I don't, I don't even know if that's the biggest theme or the biggest thing that Jamison Williams went down. That offense wasn't moving very well with him. Okay, yes, he had the biggest play that Alabama had the whole game, but he had one, and he didn't go down until you know middle of the third quarter. No, early second quarter. Yeah, it was. It, he he played less than twenty minutes of actual game time. He was he had four catches for sixty five yards already. Bill O'Brien had found a way, even though Georgia, you could tell early, was keying on him. They still were able to get him open uh, multiple times, and it, he is the he he was the most experienced receiver on the team. That's, right? Okay. Biggest but play at threat. At the end center. of the day, at the end of the day, scoring touchdowns is what matters, and Alabama couldn't do it. And while he was on the field, that red zone defense blocked them up and bottled them up. I don't know that that changes a lot. Now, I'm sure everybody in the world is going to say it does. You replace him with another five-star. Okay, it doesn't matter. Like, like I, you know, so I, I, think, I think Georgia in the second half getting the run game going and just smashed when they couldn't run it at all in the first half. I don't know what they did in the locker room to figure it out, but the offensive line was Blowing Alabama off the line when they were run blocking, and very, which is very different than pass blocking, and they were making holes and they were gashing them and they were going on long sustainable drives over and over and over again the entire second half. That's the I don't know that it's one big play. That's the most important thing that happened. And then in the fourth quarter when Bama was down real bad and they needed to come back. It was that defensive front that was getting pressure on Bryce all day long, but they weren't getting home a lot. They started to get home. He started holding the football just a hair longer, trying to make the perfect throw, and he was getting hit after hit after hit after hit, and and, it, and just the wheels came up. There was nothing he could do. Yeah, the uh, with, with Jamison in the game, they – they went down, they kicked a field goal at the Georgia 28, and that was with 12.35 left. Uh, yes, that defense was getting home. I think Jamison going out kind of flipped the entire game script, right? I think that's the biggest thing. One, it, it, this reminded me a lot of the Texas A&M game. Uh, you, you have to get home at some point in the red zone, right? Or, or not even in the red zone. You just have to score touchdowns instead of field goals. Uh, on these fourth and shorts, you have to go for it and and t- trust your defense, right? If you, I I know the way that the game was going, they were just trading field goals, especially in that first half. But you have to understand at some point that you are going to have to score a touchdown. And if Alabama were to get up, I, I think the biggest play in the game was uh, was the Latu catch, right? Latu had the the long, long uh, pass reception going down the sideline, and Keely Ringo chased him down, which, you know, as a defensive back, chasing down a tight end, you should be able to do that. But stops him, yeah, stops him at the eight-yard line, and then Alabama has to settle for a field goal. At that point, they score a touchdown there. They are up by 10 points. Georgia does not have the luxury because that ended up, uh, I think they, I think that's the one where they kicked a field goal. It might have been the one that got blocked. Uh, but that blocked field goal was also insanely huge. It kept it where Georgia could still run the ball in the second half, right? That's the biggest issue that they had in the first game is that Stetson Bennett threw the ball damn near 50 times in the first game. This time, in the second half, Stetson Bennett threw 6 out of 9 in the second half. They got back to running the football because they weren't behind. That was the biggest difference in this to me. The difference, by the way, with Bryce Young having Jamison Williams on the field compared to when he was off the field. Bryce Young was 9 of 13 for 104 yards when Williams was in, and that's uh, 11.2 yards per catch. Without him, 
265 yards, and if you take out the La two pass, that's the biggest thing. Uh, 26 out of 43, 265 yards, 8.6 yards per catch. I mean, it's a three-yard difference when they have Jamison Williams in the ball game, and it's not all to Jamison Williams. It just opens up so much more when he's in there, right? Because Georgia didn't respect anybody else that Alabama had, and and with just cause. Because, good gracious, Ajay Hall and Jaleel Billingsley and all these different guys that were dropping passes, etc. It was a train wreck. And there's a reason that these guys haven't been playing all year. And it's because of that. Because you can't depend on them in that spot. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't get there eventually. But last night, biggest stage you can be on, they were not able to do it. Let's talk about um, let's talk about Stetson Bennett right quick. The running game, obviously, was the biggest thing going for Georgia. And the fact that their defense turned the ball, or got the, the turnovers, of course. But this is massive. For Stetson, like when Stetson Bennett can throw the ball out of where he doesn't have to throw the football. How's that? Like, (laughs) I think that's the biggest thing for him. Georgia's offense is insanely good and incredibly efficient whenever they are not coming from behind, right? We saw Stetson multiple times try and press a little too much. How did you feel about Stetson and the way that the offense performed, especially in the second half? I mean, I thought he played well. I thought, you know, especially in the second half. In the first half, he looked, I mean, his first three, uh, two drives, obviously, I mean, he just looked shell-shocked. He oh, looked yeah. like he was just not prepared at all mentally for what was coming. And and he, he just was, the nerves were just visible. You could see them with your eyes how uncomfortable this was for him. And, and so, you know, I thought it was going to be a long night. He figured it out. He collected himself. I think that says a lot about somebody, man. That that says a lot about a person. You know, to, to have ice water in your veins and to never feel that fear in the situation, you know, that's one thing. And, and that might be a gift and that might be confidence and that might be swagger. There might be a lot of things that go into that. But to, but to know that you look like a bumbling idiot in front of the whole world and know that you're the reason your team is falling completely apart in front of the whole world, and then to be able to collect yourself and to write that, pull yourself out of that quicksand, that's an impressive thing. That says so much about him, I think, as a person. And, you know, forget the ability to play football, and, and is he the best quarterback, and, and, and are there guys that are going to be better than him to start later? None of that matters, all right? I'm going to tell you this. Nobody that hits Georgia's roster next year that will throw the football has that in them because so few people in the world have that in them. Yes, I, I actually tend to agree with you quite a bit on that. He he stepped up when he had to, and no, it, as far as talent and just God-given ability, there's not as much with him as with some other quarterbacks that they could possibly get on the roster. However, I don't know that anybody could be a leader the way that he became the leader of that that football team. That I think that was the biggest thing is you could tell the entire team seemed to rally around him. And it it was kind of shocking because I don't know that I saw it from them and I mean Chris, I don't have to tell you. I I've watched every Georgia game from middle of the year on just trying to get an idea, like a sense of exactly what this team is, especially leading up to the playoff. And I don't know that I really saw that out of them until really late in the year. Like, it seems like he really took this on once we got to championship level. How do you feel about that? Like, what do you think it could have happened there to, uh, to get everybody to rally around him that way? It just got better. I mean, just put the work in. You know, you can't fake that kind of stuff. And his teammates see that. You can't hide it. You know, when you're the first guy in every day and you're the last guy out and you're doing your part, knowing that you're the weak leak on the team and everybody else sees that, it's impossible to not be drawn to that. It's impossible for that to not be a magnet for you. Yeah, yeah. I could, I can see that. I can see that. The ratings are out, and they, they literally just popped up as we're recording. A 22.7 million viewers average last night. It is the, obviously it bumped up 4 million viewers from last year's record low, but it is still the second lowest in the playoff era. 
And so, I mean, not even close. Excluding 2021, Georgia-Bama is the least watched title game since 2005, and that was USC-Oklahoma. Uh, about what we expected. I mean, you, you said it the other, yeah. I think last Friday, you said, like, this will not be highly watched. I mean, it's it's still a big number. 22.6 million is not uh, awful, but, you know, not what you would hope for. Can, can we say that? No, yeah. I mean, that's, that's done. That's given. Like, it's just not what, you know, what you want. But it's what's going to happen as you're as you're getting, you know, the, the teams that you're getting and the fatigue that you're getting. So I'm not saying that it's anybody's job to manufacture parity, but, you know, it, it, it wouldn't hurt, you know, to, oh, to, yeah. to find a way to get other people in there. That's, I would imagine on uh, on Friday's show we will talk more about the college football playoff situation that's going on because it uh, appears to be – a complete cluster. It is a disaster that's going on with them. Um, I don't really have a ton of other notes on the game. Like, obviously, we could deep dive this really, really far. But uh, is there anything else about the game specifically that uh, that you would like to bring up? I mean, I'm trying to think without just, you know, just missing so much of it because a lot happened in the game. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you, when when the interception at the end happens and you just see this and just – Oh, just, just break down crying. He realize he realizes it's over. He realizes all this hell that I've gone through, all the struggle that I've gone through to try to not be the reason my team loses. Uh, you know, he realizes we're we're champions, and and I'm a huge part of this. Like, like that's that's pretty unbelievable to watch. I'm not a Georgia fan. I do not like this team. I do not like this program, and I and I don't like her. Yeah, but, but Stetson but is impossible. easy to pull for. Yeah. He's it's easy to pull impossible, for. impossible to not root for him. It's just impossible. So yeah, I tend to agree. As an Alabama fan, I yes, it is very difficult to pull against that kid. I mean, it was just it 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 was very, you know, some some of these championship games and whatnot, they they can come across very Hollywood and whatnot. And when you do get one of those games, it is perfect television, all that good stuff. Honestly, last night for Georgia was almost perfect television. The way that that game was going, you know, Georgia rams the ball down Alabama's throat and they go up 26 to 18, so there is still a a shimmer of hope at some point. And that interception return with it being Ringo and then getting to see getting to see Stetson Bennett on the sideline like that, uh, it, it was awesome for those fans. Like I, I was, you know, obviously disappointed for uh for my team. But at the same time, you know, you feel good for Georgia fans, right? This this has been a long time coming. Georgia has been really, really close so many times. So many times. A determining factor in the game, I think, was early downs. Uh, EPA for Georgia on early downs, 8.53. Negative 1.39 for Alabama on that. Uh, I mean, Alabama ran 85 offensive plays to only 56 for Georgia. That's insane. Like they they kept Alabama at five point eight yards per play. I mean that's just that is unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. And Stetson didn't yeah. throw a turnover. Yeah, he didn't throw a pick. Like I, I obviously they uh, they did the fumble and whatnot, which was uh, Houdini kind of stuff. I got, hey, let me let me talk about this. The referees in this game, it was an ACC crew. I was. I was actually rather impressed with the way that they did because it. it when you see stuff happen during the ball game, it is tough not to blow your whistle, not to call this thing dead, uh, to just let stuff happen because we see plays that get blown dead all the time, right? Them letting the plays play out and then letting it go to review multiple times, which is what you are taught to do, I thought was really impressive. Like they didn't make every correct call on the evening, obviously, but but overall, like I was fairly impressed with the referee crew. Okay, <laughs> take that. I'm, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure you were. So I, that, that's all I have to say about that. I'm certain you were. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was well called. I thought it was a well called game. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm sure you do. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Let's see. Most important plays in the game per game on paper. The most important play was, uh, let's see. It says uh, Bryce Young being sacked at the end of the game, but whatever. Let's see. Adnay Mitchell 
the 40-yard touchdown pass from Stetson Bennett that was on that free play, that was huge, huge, because Georgia's win probability before that play was 38.2%. Their win probability after was 637 That one play that Stetson took a shot on was awesome. Like, that's that was a hell of a play. Hell of a play. The second biggest play was Stetson Bennett being sacked by Christian Harris and uh, fumbling the football. And so, I, I guess, uh, as far as an analytic standpoint, uh, you agree with those two being the two biggest plays? Well, well, one of them was a real play that actually happened, and the other one was a complete another farce that didn't happen. But that's fine. Yeah, yeah. The most important play that happened for Alabama was a play that shouldn't have happened. So, yeah. That makes total <laughs> sense, by the way. <laughs> Uh, the next biggest play uh, was for Georgia. James Cook, uh, his run for 67 yards to the Alabama 13, uh, which allowed them to get into the end zone. Yeah, Cameron Latu's run for or, uh, his pass for 61 yards down to the Georgia 8. See, that's the one that you have to score on. I don't know what you could have done against that defense if you're Alabama. I don't like, it, 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 that's, that's the biggest thing. Like Everybody wants to be all over Bill O'Brien. Uh, when you... When you don't have Jamison Mitchell, or sorry, Jamison Williams, and you don't have John Mechie, I, I mean, I don't know what you do at that point. <laughs> I mean, you're down there, the field shrinks. It's like everybody just forgets. It's so much easier when you have so much space because then you can get your athletes out in space. You can find ways to get them to the football. You can't do it when the field shrinks down there towards the end zone. Uh, and Georgia's defense is so fast. I mean, like I said, this, is, it, this game was violent. I mean, both of these defenses hit so hard. It was just unbelievable. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.